I know you're a sure. familiar face to many, and uh, you know I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering about your backstory and and how you got started in in sports science. I know I've always found it really cool, you know, being a strength and performance coach. I've always enjoyed, you know, watching you know what you do and and your perspective and take on things and how you've brought a lot of the behind the scenes science to life. But I want to ask you to starting off. Were you an athlete? I mean, you know, I I uh, I get asked that question a lot. I am uh, I was a I was an athlete growing up, um, but I was I'll put athlete in quotes. I wasn't anything special. I mean, I was all right. I played football, basketball, baseball. You know, in my adult years, I you know did Ironman triathlons and a lot of endurance events. I'm more stubborn than good. Okay. And, uh, you know, so I'll just keep going, you know, in Ironman, I'm not going to win it, but I'll keep, you know, one foot in front of the other and keep going. I'll chew my arm off. It may not be good for me, but I'll do it. <laughs> You're <laughs> so, a finisher. I'm a finisher, man. And I mean, I'll, you know, it, you don't want to dare me to do something because I'll do it. <laughs> Listen, this is what I say about finishers. What's great about finishers is they actually started and most people don't start. It is, it is true. You know, I ended up doing an Ironman because my best friend at the time ran the Marine Corps marathon. And like all, you know, great friends, I said to him, that's great. How many people are in that? Aren't there like 25,000? And then they like all finish. I'm like, I, I'm sure it's really hard to run a marathon. Of course, I'd never run a marathon. So I just said, I'll do an Ironman. What's an Ironman? I don't know. So I, you know, did my first Ironman. And when I signed up for it, it was in New Zealand. I didn't know how to swim. I didn't own a bike and I had never run more than a 5k. Wow. So I, uh, I, I'm just sort of like that. Oh, I got to run, you know, I got to swim 2.4 miles and bike 112 and run 26.2. Like I'll figure it out. And I figured it out and did five of them and uh, done a bunch of, um, you know, distant, you know, extreme distance stuff, swimming and biking and uh, all kinds of stuff. And now I, I, that, I've long since retired. My body broke down. And uh, so now I'm just, you know, I just got back from the pool just a, just an hour ago. So wow. I, I try to yeah, swim look, as much as I can. You're looking good with that tan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I'm hanging out on my, my own private beach. Yeah, no, listen, hey, whatever it takes, you, you've earned it. But, uh, you know, going back, you know, with, your, with the show and everything, how did you get involved with sports science after this, you know, sort of yeah. career as an as a, as a, uh, endurance athlete? Yeah, I was involved with sports science because my production company um, really specialized in sport TV and science TV. And so the natural evolution occurred when we put those two things together in a show called XMA Extreme Martial Arts. Uh, we had Tom Cruise do the uh, raps. It was tied in with The La uh, Last Samurai. That did so well on Discovery Channel. We did a show on National Geographic called Fight Science, where we brought the world's greatest martial artists together to punch and kick the crap out of a crash test dummy to see which one gener which style generated the most amount of force and that was so successful fox owned geographic and fox sports and they ran fight science opposite uh the original eli manning versus peyton manning sunday night football game and it rated through the roof for them it was the third highest rated program with no advertising and they were like oh my god people love this stuff what else do you got i said well i have a thing called sports science so we took the fight science approach put it together and you know that was back in 2006 or 7 and we were on Fox, uh, you know, won three Emmys there, went over to ESPN, won another three Emmys, did 1,800 episodes for um, ESPN. And, you know, it, it's led to just a ton of incredible things that I'm incredibly blessed to, to be involved with. Wow, so that's pretty cool. So is, do you have a background in, in actual sports science? Like, what did you go to school for? Yeah, so my, my actual major at the University of Virginia was in rhetoric communication studies, the theory of wow. the argument. I've always been a science geek. I've always been, you know, a sports nut. I grew up in the DC area. So we had three Super Bowls with the Skins and a World Series with Cal Ripken in his rookie year and NBA championship with the Bullets. And, you know, DC used to be Sports Town USA. So I was just a total um, sports nut. And I've always just been, you know, really uh, interested in, you know, you know, good at math and science and understanding that. So that's just, I don't read fiction. I read, I like to read science and sort of, you know, everything from quantum physics to Newtonian wow. physics and anything in between. So the science programming that we were doing, you know, for many years, I think we were, I think we were around for, God, we were probably around well over a decade before we, um, 
dove into XMA, which was the first high profile um, fusion of sport and science. We've done a ton of science programs. So what I really am, honestly, is a science communicator. I mean, I, we, we get to collaborate with uh, some of the best minds and, you know, I definitely like, uh, you know, like a lot of people, even though you're not formally trained, you get to learn a lot um, from the world's greatest, uh, you know, kinesiologists and biologists and, you know, sports medicine doctors. And so I, I, I have a, uh, a really well-rounded education um, in terms of creating sports science. I remember, you know, in 2007, when we created, and even 2006, it was 2006 because there was no iPhone, there were no wearables and the term sports science wasn't really a term. It yeah. wasn't, it hadn't, you know, it hadn't penetrated um, society yet. So, you know, we were in the right place at the right time for sure. Yeah. You got to think uh, maybe you were sort of behind a lot of it. I think we, we definitely played a, a part in it. I mean, obviously without the show sports science, and without what we did, everything, probably still occurs, but it just may have taken longer. It may have been called something different. Um, you know, I, we were just really fortunate. Um, obviously, I think we accelerated it. We were able to shine a bright light on it. We were, you know, we allowed people to really look at sport through a different lens. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very strange to say prior to sports science, there was very limited programming breaking down the science of something. There were a lot of books, a lot of specials, a um, lot of a lot of individual things um, that looked at it, but we were, you know, the first sort of mass-produced mainstream program specifically on sports science, and you know, to this day there isn't you know a major competitor in that space. So it's yeah. um, it, it's been it's just been incredible. No, it's super cool because you take some really complicated stuff on the science front, and this is what I find interesting about your major of communication. You really are a communicator of research and distilling it down to a very simple, consumable form. And, and I think yeah. a lot, you know, in pro sports today, like internally, there's, there's sort of this gap that exists where I find what you do to be very interesting because you, the front offices are so analytics driven, but on field, actually they're not because they don't understand that communication highway is a little bit blocked. So it's, I think it's pretty cool what, 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 you, what you do. Oh, I appreciate it. I mean, we, you know, again, you know, there's a lot of, you know, persistence and there's a lot of just doing it, you know, uh, yeah. people, uh, you know, all the time, like, how do I get your job? How did you get your job? How did you do it? I mean, it's, look, we made it. I mean, there was no, there, nobody asked us to make it. It was, it was something that was being made and we, you know, ended up just having a vision and executing on it and it worked out. Now it's, it is, um, you know, it, when I tell you the number, when people say, you know, what's your superpower? Everybody's got a superpower. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good at making something out of nothing. Like it doesn't exist. I want to make it, you know, what is that thing? So I'm really, it, I'm, I'm, I become quite adept at saying, here is a, a product. Here's a message. Here's a something. It's just being a creative. Um, that, that, that's something that it just takes, it takes a, a, a belief in yourself and a belief that it may be great. It may not be great. It might be good. All, I, all you can do is do your best and the chips fall where they may. Yeah. There are a lot of programs and a lot of projects I end up working on. They're not nearly as high profile as sports science that I'm ridiculously proud of. Why did it not make it, you know, to a certain level? It's a product of timing and circumstance and, you know, all kinds of things that are beyond your control. But I love to you know, I love to give people sort of that vision, that, that vision of being, um, you know, a musician and, you know, the world's greatest songs were written in some small, tiny room at an odd hour, you know, it wasn't particularly, you know, calculated. It was a moment of inspiration. They just made it and it, it, it may have made it, it may not have made it, but the right, it was the right place, right time, right thing, but you had to make it in order to see what would happen. Yeah, no, that's cool. So do you have, do you have a set process as it relates to creation specifically? Like, are you someone that designates time? Okay, I'm going to create now, or I'm going to develop now. I'd love to learn about your process. I really, I honestly am, the, the, the process is when the mood hits me. I mean, it's, yeah. it could be 3 a.m., it could be whenever. I'm like, oh, that's a cool idea. And I'm really big on pushing things forward, just literally pushing things forward and getting it out. Um, 
you know, perfection is the enemy of progress because yeah. people try to, oh, I don't know if this is ready for prime time and I don't know. And it's like, believe in yourself, man, put it out there. You know, of course you're, you're not going to have it all figured out, but you know, I keep, re I love the reference things like the iPhone. Um, you know, the iPhone, honestly, generation one beyond the design, which changed the entire landscape. I mean, it just blew everybody. Nobody, had, it was a space age device. You couldn't search a name. You had to scroll through context. It was so far away from being really functional. And remember the mail application like totally blue. It yeah. was like, oh my God, this, you have this magical piece of glass, but I don't know exactly how to use it in business because BlackBerry was so much better at the time. It, it, but it was out there. And once it was out there, you know, if they had waited for everything to be perfect, they wouldn't have been able to capture as much market share as they did and change the world. You just got to get it out. Yeah. Um, you got to be something. So my process very much is, you know, in the belief, it, you know, if you stick to your core values, make something that you're proud of, make something that you can, you know, let your kids watch and that you don't have to apologize for and be able to say, yeah, this is the best that I could do with what I had when I had it move forward with whatever that thing is. That's really my process is when the mood strikes me, just you know, strike while the iron's hot. Yeah, no, it's, it's great advice because I always say we're, today we're in this uh, like heavy duty goal setting culture process culture, you know, people feel like every minute of their day has to be accounted for and every, and, and it jams them up. They're trying to be so perfect, but every great entrepreneur knows that exactly like you said, you know, perfection is almost the enemy because it's impossible and it'll, it it'll jam you up from getting a concept out there and, and that first step to bringing something to life. Definitely. I mean, with, without a doubt. And it's really having the courage to do it. So many people, you know, I wrote a New York Times bestselling book. It won a bunch of Emmys. I've been on TV forever. And when people are like, oh my God, I can't believe you did that. I'm like, honestly, that was never the plan. I owned a company. I never planned on being on screen, never planned on being a host or an author or anything. It was never even in the cards. It just, it happened that way because as we made it's sports science. We needed a host. And I was incredibly average in size. And I knew what we had to say. And the GM of Fox Sports really liked me and was like, hey, you should be the host of this because I was free. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I was free. I was like the, I was the best option because we didn't have any money to pay for somebody. So, all right, I'll do it. And then that turns into something. If it's, you, you know, if you're actually halfway decent at it and it's a net positive, it turns into something. And then one thing leads to another. Now you're going down a path that you never envisioned but you yeah. wouldn't have even seen that. And that's a, a lot of people have sort of like that end result in mind. They'll say, you know what? I want to be a movie star. They'll say, I want to be a movie star. I want to be an actor. I want to be an actor. And as it turns out, maybe they're great. They're a great editor. And maybe it turns out in that process, you discover, well, you wanted to be a great actor, but you're not, you're, you're just, no matter what you do, you're just not that great. And it turns out you're an awesome editor. So go that way. And it's kind of like the ability to recognize what you're good at, um, to recognize the value that you bring to the table. It's all a, an exchange of not only energy, but value. You know, are you valuable to the proposition that's in front of you? And a lot of people are delusional in thinking they're not replaceable and thinking that they have to do one role. You know, you got to be a team player, figure out where you fit and be able to move forward that way. Yeah, no, it's true. People get so stuck on, you know, this is what I want to do. Even if they suck at it, they continue to think yeah. that that's the answer. And it's like, no, you'd actually be great at this, like you said. And, and also to what you said, you know, listen, you're, you're obviously a passionate guy about, you know, what it is that, that you're doing, which is, and people are very attracted to that. And, and you believe in what you're doing. So all super important stuff. So totally. now they, so, you know, so now, totally. I mean, that passion is, it's important. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to talk about your, your, what I, I think maybe a new passion, you know, you have the energy drink company that you're now a part of. Yep. Tell us about that. How did you get involved with Kill Cliff? What excited you about it? So, you know, sports science, um, really afforded me some incredible opportunities. I got to work with some of the, the world's largest brands like Nike and Ford and TaylorMade Under Armour, Gillette and Intel and a whole bunch of giant companies. I'm doing ad campaigns for them. Um, and I'm really, really seeing, okay, well, here's the world of marketing and here's, 
what's the difference between, you know, a single message and a campaign and what's the process really like? And I, you know, I was incredibly fortunate to be exposed to, I like to say one of everything, mm. one of every kind of product in the performance space. And I am a, a person who try, lives as clean a lifestyle as you could possibly imagine. I mean, I am, I am boring. I've never done any illegal drug of any kind. I only drank alcohol, you know, as a, you know, rebellious little kid. I haven't had a, you know, drink since I was, you know, in college. So I don't drink alcohol. I, I literally drink water. And it, prior to Kill Club, it was water and nothing else. And everybody sends me their product, drink this. I'm like, Gatorade makes me sick. You know, most, dr most drinks have so much sugar and they're loaded with synthetic caffeine. I just never got behind anything. I couldn't get behind anything because it, it didn't fit what I believed in. And that's, and that's fine. Um, so Kill Cliff came along and it's this clean energy drink. And has you know no it has no sugar, no, nothing artificial, all clean green ta a, a clean green tea caffeine, um, and it and I, so I started just consuming it and feeling awesome and and saying you know what this really fits it it fits from a product standpoint my life and what I believe in. Not only that, it fits my ethos as a person. It's the, look, it's, it's founded by a Navy SEAL, run by a Navy SEAL, very American, very Americana brand. Yeah. Um, it's a bold, unapologetic brand. And because of that, I'm like, you know what? This would be amazing to be able to take to the masses and, you know, really preach the gospel of Kill Cliff because I believe in it. So the, all of the ad campaigns and companies that I've been involved with, that I've been able to say to the audience who I've been incredibly fortunate to have, I believe what I'm saying because it fits, it fits me and it fits my lifestyle. So Kilcliff falls into that category and it's something that I encourage everyone, uh, you know, go to Kilcliff, K-I-L-L-C-L-I-F-F.com. Energy drinks by and large, if you just stop to think about it, you, you look at, you know, 300 milligrams of synthetic caffeine and sugar through the roof. I'm telling you, sugar is bad for you. I'm just telling you. It doesn't take me as, as a, you know, the sports science guy to tell you sugar is bad. You can look it up. It's bad for you. You want to cut that out. So if you can get a drink that's a healthy alternative that doesn't have anything synthetic, nothing artificial, nothing fake, no sugar, you should be consuming that. Now, our, our slogan at Kill Cliff is own it. I'm telling you, for lack of a better word, the big brand energy drinks are toxic. I mean, if you, you can look up all of the videos and all the research you want about pennies dissolving in the liquid and eating through nails and what it does to your intestines, God, God only knows, but for lack of a better word, they're toxic. So if you want to drink a toxic energy drink, just own it. Like yeah. you do it, you be you. you, there is an alternative. There is a clean energy drink that tastes better, is better for you. Own the decision, own your life and move forward. And, and when we're looking at sort of the, you know, state of affairs, when people are saying, well, what makes you sick? Being, if you're not healthy, and if you're asking your body to process stuff that it shouldn't, it, in general, your immune system gets compromised. I mean, it's, you can't live on cotton candy. I mean, that's like, duh. So think about if you're drinking cotton candy, that's not good for you. Yeah. So I got to ask you this, Kill Cliff, it's definitely a bold and uh, unforgettable name. Where does, right. it come from? Where does it come from? Kill Cliff. It's, uh, you know what? I go to, there are a lot of answers to that. If you go to the website, conspiracytruthfinders.com, you may be able to find that there actually is a memo that's been leaked mm. that gives the background for the name Kill Cliff. Um, a lot of people think that it, you know, it, it, look, I can't tell you for sure. There are articles out there that's talking about the founder of the company, uh, his roommate was named Cliff. And, you know, they, as a joke, they call it Kill Cliff. There are other people who, think that it may have been named after some sort of secret project, go to conspiracytruthfinders.com and you can find out what Kill Cliff's all about. I guess we'll find out if Cliff is still alive too. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you don't know. I mean, you, don't, you just don't know these days. No, totally. So what, what do you like most about what you're doing now with the company? I, you know, have, I, what I love is being part of a company that has obviously just great people um, and a great product. So I, you know, the rule, the rule was with sports science. Remember sports science is just one of 20 different programs we had on the air. It was just the best known. 
you know, the rule is, can you go home at night and tell your kids, you know what, I made the world a little bit of a better place today. You know, what did I do, what did I do today? Mm. Um, and then you're putting out positive energy. So anytime that you can be associated with positive people, positive product, um, and say, you know, the, if I got somebody off of a toxic energy drink today and onto something better, I, believe it or not, you can look up all the stats you want about the rate of stomach cancer, you know, among the youth today that is to skyrocket. And there are all kinds of theories. Um, and I'm not saying that it's, that there may only be one reason, but I, I can tell you that, it, you know, any kind of health issue is exacerbated by putting things that are not healthy into your body. So what I love is being able to message it's something I genu genuinely believe in and really passionate about. Yeah. I got a question for you outside of drinking Kill Cliff. What do you do to keep your energy and spirits up to, to do all that you're doing? Love, period. You know, got a great wife, great kid, great family. Um, our job on this planet is to perpetuate love. And, and that sounds super corny, but that really is what it's all about. Um, you know, it, if you think about sort of that, the, the model that we've set up, you know, you, you should grow up, you should realize, oh, maybe I, maybe I should not be selfish. Maybe I should give back to others. That's an act of love. Maybe I should give back to not one person, but everyone. And maybe I should be a beacon of hope on the hill for people who haven't quite realized that love is the answer. So, you know, what, what, you know, energizes, um, what energizes me and, and obviously um, I'm not alone is giving back to the world. Get, you give back to your kids and your wife and your family and your friends and the world. And if it, when you're, when you're in the mode of being positive, there's what's there to be unhappy about. Like there, yeah, there's horrible things that happen in the world and happen in your day every day, all the time, but you're living, you're breathing, you're seeing, you're thinking, you're able to, you know, you're able to, you know, it, to me, the most important skill is the ability to think. So if you can think, then you can do something. And those thoughts manifest themselves in all kinds of ways. So, you know, it, it sounds super corny, but I, I honestly believe it. I believe that love, love is, an, is, you know, not only a state of mind and state of being, but it's an act and action. And that's what keeps me energized. Yeah. Well, it sounds like- Am I a dork for saying that? No, no, you're not. It's because it's true. I mean- it's people will take what they want from this and that's okay. They can. I always say, listen, you know, think what you want, but we don't care anyway. We're just here to do, do our good deed and, and put that love out yeah. there you know, for people. But no, you got to love what you do. And that's, that's the thing. It sounds like it, it, it almost sounds like I, I call I, I want to call you almost like a creative where you love what you do. You're creating, you're building, you're developing and you're challenging yourself. And in doing so, you know, it creates that energy. Yeah, it does create, it, it perpetuates itself. It becomes this, it, it, it's interesting because yeah, you have to stop and say, wow, what I did was really cool. And, you know, I'm proud of that. And that's interesting, but I have never been, I've never been one to stop at all. Like, I'm like, I kind of like look at it as I blow past it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that was kind of cool. Anyway, next thing, let's just keep going and keep raising the bar because I think if you park too long in any one space uh, in life, you can, you know, I, I love the metaphors of water. And I love the idea of, you know, if, if you have that beautiful, you know, we're, we're on this like rushing river and we're going down and the water is calm and some water gets pushed off to the side and it forms like a little, you know, eddy. But if, it's st if it stays still and isn't moving, then you get algae that's built on top and you get you know, debris that floats over there and it just yeah. becomes very stagnant. So you got to keep moving and keep moving. And, it, you know, to me, I'm always moving and always wanting to, to do better and to, you know, spread positive energy and to, you know, be, gen you know, be authentic. You know, that's it, the great thing about Kill Cliff is it's such, I mean, with a name like Kill Cliff, you can't be anything but authentic. <laughs> I yeah, mean, it's, no, it's, it's like, we are what we are and we're clean energy drink and we own it, you know, like here we are. So it's, it, it, it fits, it fits my lifestyle and fits everything that I've done to a T. Yeah. I think it's cool too, because it's, again, it, it, it's a unique brand. And again, you're, you're sticking with what you know. I mean, it's sticking, you're, it's maintaining that military spirit. And, and I think it just stands for a lot of good. That's why I, I appreciate you talking about it. So I have one last question for you. I call this the becoming a champion show. It's a show on performance. You're a perfect fit, but what does the word champion mean to John Brankus? 
You know, champion is the, the relentless pursuit of excellence. That's what a champion is, right? And it can, can be in a given amount of time or it can be over a lifetime. But that genuine relentless pursuit, I mean, you think about, um, you know, you think about it, it could be a sprint, right? I mean, you could be a champion in a sprint and you like, you just don't wake up, roll up the couch and you're the champion of, of the sprint. You got to train for it. And, but that becomes a very isolated thing. The question is, what do you want to be a champion of? If it's life, if you want to be a champion in life, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? And it's one foot in front of the other. And it's, you know, those who you like persist prevail. Like you just keep going and going and going. And so being a champion is, is being super authentic and understanding that you need to keep going no matter what. Um, the, the poem, Don't Quit, is a great one that people should look up. I, I think that that is the definition of being a champion. All right, we're going to have to get on that. I'm going to have to post that with this episode. Post it. Yeah, I'm on it. Cool, John, thanks. I'm on it. You got a lot of stuff going on, as we can tell. But uh, we'll put the link to Kill Cliff. We'll get everybody, you know, cheersing you and, and drinking the Kill Cliff drink. So thanks for hanging with me. And awesome. I, I appreciate Yeah, check it out. We just launched a drink with uh, Joe Rogan called The okay. Flaming Joe. Everybody should check it out. Go to killcliff.com. It's, it's an unbelievable drink. They had a whole CBD line, and that's we launched a new flavor with Rogan on it. And uh, it's doing great, and we're very blessed. So. Check it out. See if you want to support, you know, Navy SEALs and the Navy SEAL Foundation and support it yourself. Yeah. You don't really support yourself. Put something good into your body. You won't regret it. That's for sure.